Good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We have a wonderful service plan for you all today. Wonderful chance for you to encounter God. Just a reminder, um, there are there are deacon ballots that are due today. If you if you have taken the time to go through this process spiritually, I'd encourage you to uh, before you wrote anybody's name down and nominated them to pray through that, and then to approach that person and say. Hey, I'm thinking about putting your name in and nominating you. How do you feel about that? Do you feel the Lord leading you in that direction? And um, those are due. And if you need one, they're right here on the front pews. Just a reminder, there's an offering box in the back. There's uh, offering uh, plates here on the front row. We are grateful to God that you have chosen to gather with us and worship with us this day. And uh, we're going to have a special prayer time later for our schools and for some other issues. But I would remind you that today at 2 o'clock, if you're interested in having a prayer over our schools, we're going to be meeting at Hardytown Baptist Church and then giving some directions, instructions from there. And we'll be having a chance to pray over our schools. Uh, I think we're a week and a day away, right? I don't know if that's amen for some and oh me for others, <laughs> right? Um, but we are, uh, they're excited. Teachers are excited. Students are <laughs> somewhat excited. But we want to bless that opportunity. We're, great again, grateful to God you're here. May the Lord speak to you, and may you have a genuine sense of worship this morning. Rob, come and read. Pray for us. Good morning, church. We read from the book of Psalm, chapter 85, verses 8 through 13. Let me hear what the Lord, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground. The righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, thank you for the great privilege of giving us another day to gather together and glorify you, Father. Uh, we just pray that you will teach us, God, your ways and your statutes, Father, that our words and our deeds and our lives are pleasing in your sight, Father. Thank you for your Son, God. Thank you for all that he is to us and all that he's done for us and all he continues to do. Father, as a, in our nation right now, as our, our future seems uncertain, Father God, we know that you are certain, Father God. We know that you are sovereign, Father. Thank you for this great reminder to keep our eyes fixed on you and to trust in you and to have faith in you, Father. More than anything, thank you for the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, Father. Thank you for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist. We're going to get started this morning. And uh, to start, Mr. Andy's a little under the weather, so he's not going to be with us today. This is Miss Shelby Smith. This is Cecil Smith's daughter. She's been attending here since right about the beginning of the COVID starting back in March. So she's going to join us uh, up here. And uh, we're going to start with crown him with many crowns. Go into we have come into his house. And then the chorus, oh Lord, how marvelous. And let's stand for this first section, if you don't mind. <laughs> Oh, okay. 
this afternoon. You can gather together with us at Hardy Town and we're going to head out. I think we're going to group up around the flag poles of the schools and pray for them. And um, we want to pray for our teachers and our administrators and our students. Uh, we also want to pray for Tinley Beecham heading out today uh, for uh, Air Force basic training and then a follow along with a school uh, preparing to be a meteorologist in the Air Force. Zach Hall's headed out today to college. I think Caden Baker this week, Thursday, heading out to school. And so we want to remember those students as they progress um, to that next phase of life. But uh, let's pray for these things. Join us together. Father, first of all, we just lift up this chance to continue to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, might someone have an encounter with you today, a supernatural encounter. Might someone have a life-changing moment. It can only come through the spirit of God. Father, we pray for our schools. I pray for superintendent, school board. Pray for our teachers, our principals, our coaches. Father, we pray for every student that's preparing to go back. It is a trying, challenging, it's a brave new world. Not only for educators, but for students. Father, we pray you watch over our schools. Pray that you would... Give them, uh, give teachers and administrators, give them wisdom and direction for every step and every issue they encounter. For students, Lord, um, just give them, give them peace. I'm sure that there are teachers and students with anxiety. Lord, would you give them calmness as they step back into this? Lord, we pray for a good, safe school year. We pray for an atmosphere that lets students learn. Father, I pray for the teachers. And for the students that know Christ, that they will carry Christ back on campus with them. That they will, the teachers will love in a way that displays their relationship with Jesus. And that students who know Christ will use these moments as evangelistic opportunities to share Christ with people who may not um, know you and your son. Father, I pray that a revival may bloom at our schools be a life-changing opportunity. God, we pray for these others that are that are preparing for a new phase of life. We think about the Tinley, Lord. I ask you as uh, just guide every step as she prepares for basic training and then on to school or give her a, a good experience in the U.S. Air Force. 
for Zach and for Caden, Lord, as they uh, begin the next journey of adulthood. Or give them uh, peace. It, it's tough enough to leave home and to journey out into college. But all of this makes it even harder. Everything seems to be a little harder right now. And so for anxiety for these families and for other families that are preparing for a college journey, God, would you walk with them, strengthen them, encourage them, give them hope. And Lord, for our congregation, would you give us boldness to continue to, to share Christ, continue to worship, continue to preach the word. And Lord, we just thank you that you have providentially led us even to this very moment of gathering together. You are are leading us into truth. You are leading us on a journey. You're our shepherd, our great shepherd. And so we just cry out to you this morning, believing you hear us, you know our concerns and our burdens, and that you will hear them and respond in your way, in your time, according to your will. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a chorus, Jesus Messiah, that uh, we've sung before. And uh, as we do, you know, things are a little different for us up here because some of you or most of you aren't singing or at least not singing as much as you normally do. And if you had a mask on, we wouldn't know either way. Um, so things are a little bit different for us. Um, you know, a lot of other churches do things a lot differently. Some have special lights. And my cousin uh, used to work at a church or be at a church that... He was the fog smoke guy. His job was to make sure there was an 18-inch blanket of fog for the singers on stage. And we could do any or all of that if you really thought it would help you worship. I've got a sneaking suspicion, though, that if you are not doing the right things Monday through Saturday, it really doesn't matter what we do up here. It's probably not going to have any significance to you at all especially if you don't listen to the words. So as we sing this next song, and as you sing along with us or not, especially pay attention to the words.
you have your Bibles, if you'll take and turn with me to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. I'm not going to read the whole psalm. Not even going to speak about the whole psalm. But really one or two verses from the 25th psalm. And uh, as you're making your way there, I, I'm just going to... Um, you can put up the next slide. Somebody hit the next slide. There you go. Psalm 25. And the, the, the title of this message is Lead Me in Truth. Lead Me in Truth. And I think well, I talked several weeks ago... Uh, in one of the Psalms about the path you're on, you know, the path of righteousness and the, the path of, that, that leads to perishing. And this morning, I kind of want to take you a little further down one of those paths, and that being the path of truth. And I think sometimes we just want the truth, don't we? I mean, don't we just want the truth? Um, I wonder if you've ever said this to your children. We, I said this to my kids this week, um, maybe just yesterday. Just tell me the truth. Anybody ever told their kids that? You're not going to get in trouble. Just tell me the truth. We had a barbecue sandwich incident this weekend. Uh, we had one, a half a sandwich go missing in our home. You think it's funny. It really wasn't funny. It wasn't even, I wasn't even going to consume it. It was for someone else in the home. And I mean, all that was left was a tin foil in the trash can. And we tried to figure out, did the dog eat it? Somebody leave it on the counter? I mean, we, here's what I actually said. You're going to think I'm a horrible dad. I said, look, either somebody confess up or nobody's going to eat any food till we get the truth. <laughs> they said, what? You can't starve us. I said, somebody will get hungry and somebody will tell the truth, right? So sometimes we just want to know the truth. It comes to media too, right? It comes to the media, we say things like, look, I don't want the bias. I don't want to know what's filtered through. Just give me the facts. And as, a, edu as an educated person that can do a little bit of logic, if you'll give me the facts, I'll figure out how this applies to me. We just want the truth of the facts of the event. And so we want to hear truth. So this message, lead me in truth. All right, if you'll stand, we're going to read a few verses from the 25th Psalm. Psalm of David. He says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh, my, my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Verse 4 and 5, we're going to emphasize these. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. And teach me, uh, lead me in your truth. Excuse me. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. The word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to share with you um, just a few truths, a few big truths out of Scripture that if you're on this path, if you're on the path of righteousness and you're walking with the Lord, you're going to see some guideposts. So I want you to imagine that you're out hiking and you, you've been hiking out and out and you've seen these guideposts. They let you know you're at mile marker 1.4. You're at mile marker 1.6. Or when you quit seeing those posts, you know what? You're lost. And somebody's going to be coming looking for you before dark. And so they don't want that and you don't want that. So there's some guideposts on your journey. There are guideposts in Scripture and guideposts of truth. So when we say, lead me in your truth, verse 5, and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and for you I wait all the day long. We're talking about the shepherd, the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, leading us on a journey, and he's leading us on a path of truth. We're talking about the, the Jesus of John 10. I am the great shepherd leading us on a path of truth. And so here are five just really big, important truths that we know about being a Christian. There, may, there are many more, but here are just five that are really important that if you would say, I'll commit my life to believing in these five truths, it's powerful and uh, changing. Here's the first one. There's a God. 
There's a God. Before there was anything else, there was a God. Before there was a, a world, before there was a speck of particle in the entire universe, there was God. There was God the Father. There was God the Son. There was God the Holy Spirit. Before there was the beginning of the world, there was God. He was not invented. He was not created. He's not the means of, of just religion. He's not some sort of philosophical thing that's made up. There is a holy and righteous God that existed before anything. And so we have to understand that that's truth, that there is a truth, that there is a God. In fact, we look at one of the Psalms. It said, a fool says in their heart, there is no God, right? We would believe as a Christian that one of the greatest truths is that, is that God exists. And he's not, listen to this, he's not just the man upstairs. We use these really flippant terms to describe God sometimes. He's not the man upstairs. He's a holy being that is sinless and blameless and is jealous and wants to be glorified and wants our worship. There's a God. Here's another big truth that flows out of that, that he created everything. He made everything. Listen to this. He made everything we would believe from Genesis out of nothing. There wasn't a, there wasn't a speck that he took and then made everything out of it. He created it out of nothing. And he made all of it. He made the earth. He made the planets. He made the stars. He made the moon. He made the universe. He made the galaxies. And you ready for this? He made things you can't even see. He made things that human beings with all of our engineering, all of our technology, we can't even build something that gets a glimpse of what all God made. And then check this out. He didn't just stop there. The Bible tells us he took the dirt of the earth and he made you after he made the animals. He made you and he breathed life into Adam. And from Adam, he made Eve, his a helpmate for Adam. He created us. And so part of the truth, if you're going to be on this journey of following Christ and of being on a path of righteousness as your Savior is leading you, we need to believe there's a God and we need to believe he made it all. Can I explain how he made it? No. Do I need to be able to? No. Here's the greatest takeaway. God made it. And then God made us and crafted us. You know what else God did? He gave us this. He gave us this. This is a truth that this is more than a book of history. This is more than a reference book. This is a book made up of 66 books. And God inspired the writer of every one of those books to capture the truth and the ideas that God intended. You know what else, though? God used the personality of every writer. He let every writer define their syntax and define their illustrations and their stories and who they were and how they wrote it. But it is inspired by God. I give you this scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out. Just as God breathed life into that body that he made out of nothing, the truth is that God Breathe out scripture. And it in the Bible tells us it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. If you want to be on a journey of truth, and I'll just remind you of this, truth exists. Don't let the media, don't let any book, don't let any movie tell you that truth doesn't exist. There is truth. And listen, it's right here. And this book is God's revelation to us about who he is. It reveals to us who he is. Listen, it's more than a book we grab a quote from and throw up on Facebook or Instagram. It is a book that if we'll study, read, love, cherish, and dig deep in, will change our lives. It is, the, it is more than, the, than another book. Um, holy book. And so I would encourage you, if you want to know who God is, open up the Bible and study the word of God verse by verse, 
truth by truth, and it will be life changing. But there's another part of this journey, this path we're on. We're on this little path. We're walking this path of righteousness. We're walking past these guideposts and we're realizing there's a God. And then we're realizing, wait, this God made everything. And that this God is not just God. He's God the Father. He's God the Son. He's God the Holy Spirit. He's three in one. Three distinct persons of the Trinity. And that they all were there at creation. You say they all were there at creation. Absolutely. Jesus, it tells us in John 17 that he had glory before the world existed. When we read, read Colossians 1, just a few weeks ago, Shana stood here, or somebody stood here and read our, began our service by reading Colossians 1. that says that Christ made it all. That he was the one that designed it. All things were made by him and through him and in him all things hold together. And that the Holy Spirit of God, part of the Godhead, was there, president creation. So if you're on this path, you're on this journey, you're walking and you're saying, where are the guideposts? God, creation, scripture. And listen, we need to be people who realize there are times we don't always agree and like scripture. You ready for this? That doesn't change its truth. Just because you don't like it. Just because there's some section where you say, I don't want to read that anymore. I don't like Romans. I don't like this book or that book. It's still the word of God. It's still timely and accurate and pointed and purposed. And it's still inspired by God. But there's something else we need to realize as believers, as Christians, if you're walking on this journey, that there is this thing called the cross and the resurrection. The cross and the resurrection. That these are events that change the world. Listen to what Paul says in Corinthians. The word of God is folly or foolishness, your translation may say, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. If you're going to be on this pursuit, if you're going to be on this journey, if you're going to be on this path, one of the greatest guide stones is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You need to believe that, friend. You need to believe that there was a man who was murdered on a cross for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. And that they took Christ and they buried him. And then on the third day, he rose again. By the power of God, he rose again. And it is what we ought to be telling the world. Now, you know what the world thinks? The Bible says it, right? The world thinks that it's foolishness, silly talk. The world thinks, how would a God that made everything declare a cross as the means to kill his son? That's why the Bible says it's foolishness to them. But to us, but to believers, but to Christians, it is the thing that changed the world. It changed history and hopefully it changed your life. Listen, we need to make the truth the cross. And the cross needs to be something in our life that we're willing to tell others about because we absolutely believe it. We believe the facts of it. We believe the the ramifications of it, the redemptive nature of it, that we believe and are people of the cross. Now, four of these, the, the four I've shared with you, did you know this, that uh, a lost person could agree with those? Did you know that? A lost person can tell you, there's a God. James tells us that demons even believe and shudder. You may even find a lost person that says, uh, I can't really go along with evolution. So I do believe somehow something created all of this. You might even find a lost person that would tell you uh, this is a holy book. This is on par with all of the other religious and sacred writings and it should be esteemed and valued. You might even find a lost person who would say, well, I've read the historical accounts of the early centuries after the death of Christ. And I genuinely do believe there was a cross. I believe it was a historic event. 
I really believe these things. So you could be lost and affirm these four truths without too much problem. But here's one you can't affirm. If you're going to be on this path of truth, on this path of righteousness, and here's a big truthful guidepost for you, that salvation only comes through the gospel. Now you're saying, wow, now we're deviating from this idea. Now we're down something that everybody can't confirm, that everybody can't say that's a truth. Well, here's what I'll tell you. Jesus came and here's one of his famous I am statements. I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And no man comes to the father except through me. And so I would ask you this morning, do you understand that the life changing, world changing truth is that the gospel redeems and, and changes people? See, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road for people. Again, you might have even sat here and said, oh, I believe those four things. And I get to the last one and tell you that there is only salvation in one name. There is only eternal life in one name. And you begin to say, as many in the world would say, no, pastor, I struggle with that. People might say philosophically, as they have for generations, we're all sort of climbing up different sides of the mountain to get to God. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, I am the way. And I am the truth. And I am the life. And so I would ask you this morning, do you affirm that this salvation only comes through the gospel of Jesus? And what is the gospel? What is the gospel? It's this, that a man was born of a virgin and that he walked on this earth and that he didn't commit any sins, that he was blameless, that he tried to have a group of men that followed him, they called him rabbi, they wanted to be like him, and that he taught them, and then he lived with them, and then he walked with them, and that he was betrayed by one of them, and that he was tried, and in the middle of his ministry, he confronted Pharisees and Sadducees, he touched people he wasn't supposed to touch, he performed miracles that were unheard of, brought dead people back to life, the blind were able to see, the lame walked, he's tried, and he's killed. And it's not the end of the story, but on that Friday, blood poured out of his body and that blood paid for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And that it redeemed us, it purchased us, it bought us. And then we are no longer slaves of righteousness, but we are slaves to the Lord, the Bible tells us, Paul wrote it. And then they took his lifeless body and they put it in the tomb thinking it was the end. And then his disciples came to claim his body with, with spices. And when they got there, the tomb was empty and that Christ had been resurrected. That's the gospel, friends. And now this one truth that we would hopefully all affirm. You know what the world will say? I've got to get off the train there. I can't do this thing. Well, I'm telling you, Jesus says... He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. What does this psalm say? Lead me in your truth, lead me like a shepherd from the 23rd Psalm, like the Jesus of John chapter 10, the great shepherd. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. I would ask you two questions today, Christians, two questions. One would be, are you one of these people who would object to some of these biblical truths? They're always in church. They'll say, I don't know if I can affirm that God created everything. Are you one of those people that say, oh, Pastor, I, I like this Bible thing, but uh, there's some chapters that I just don't read. I just think they're old and they don't apply. And I just don't like that truth that Paul shared. Are you one of those people that think, no, I think there's more than one way to get there. God wouldn't be so narrow. Well, Jesus says he is. That the road is narrow. 
The gate is narrow. The means to enter into eternal life is narrow. You're one of those people that this morning need to say, I've just rejected some of the truths of Scripture. Maybe this is a morning to say, I need to repent of those things. See, repentance isn't just for the one moment when you become a believer. Repentance is throughout our life, throughout our walk with Jesus, when we're confronted with the truths of Scripture. But then for someone else this morning, how about this? Have you really ever understood salvation comes through the gospel? Have you really ever repented of your sins, turned from disobedience and turned to obedience? Have you really ever embraced Christ as Savior? Have you really ever understood that you can know Christ through his saving work on the cross? See, that's truth. That's truth. There's so many more truths in Scripture. But these are five really big, important truths that if you're going to be on a path with Jesus, if you're going to say, Lord, lead me into truth, you're going to be confronted with these things. You're going to be confronted with them in the word. You're going to be confronted with them in your walk. And every person will have to decide. I can't tell you what truth is if you believe it. I can tell you that truth exists because I believe that truth exists. Because I believe that there's only one God. I believe there was only one creation story. I believe there's only one word inspired by God. But only the Holy Spirit of God will convict your heart to believe the truths of God. And so I would challenge you this morning. First, have you ever, have you ever rejected these truths? And is this morning a moment where the Spirit's calling you to say, Lord, would you forgive me? And then to others today that maybe are on that path. You're not on the path with the shepherd. He's not leading you. You're going down the path of perishing. That today might be the day that you respond to the free gift of the gospel and follow after Christ, the shepherd that loves your soul and wants to save you. You stand as we pray. Father, there's truth. I believe there's truth. You know there's truth, Lord. Even when we say you aren't true, even if we argue of your existence, you're still there. And Father, this morning, I would imagine there are many here that have often struggled with the reality of truth. They've pushed back on some areas. They've rejected some claims. And Father, you continue to lead us down this path of truth. And you lead us not only down the path of truth, but you lead us into salvation. So I would pray for, for all those this morning that heard this message outside and heard it inside. and Maybe there's some areas that before we walk out of this room, during this prayer time, need to repent and believe and accept the truth. And Lord, maybe there are others here today, young and old, who say, I've really never understood the gospel. That Christ, your son, came to live and to die sinless and blameless for my sins, for the sins of the world. And that today... Even the worst of sinners can repent and believe in the facts and the truth of the gospel and can know you in a personal way. Father, we thank you that these truths are reminders of you and that there are many, many more in Scripture that we can go on and on and on looking at your revelation to us in the word and we can mine truth after truth but Lord might these just whet our appetites for desiring you more God we love you we're thankful for your cross 
We're thankful for an empty tomb. We're thankful for the church that your son is the head of. Bless us as we go. Let hearts be restless if decisions need to be made. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.